Welcome to this short recorded service for Pentecost Sunday. Uh, it's called Pentecost Sunday because Pentecost is the Greek word for 50 and it's 50 days since Easter and Jesus' death and resurrection. And this Sunday celebrates the Holy Spirit coming in power on the disciples in Jerusalem. Uh, our reading tells that story. It's from Acts chapter 2 and is read by Sharon and Derek. Our preacher is Sir Mark Headley and our prayers are from Anne. And my name is Henry Corbett, vicar at St John Chrysostom's in Everton and St Peter's Everton and warden of Shrewsbury House. Uh, we have three famous hymns, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Uh, we have a prayer to the Holy Spirit, Breathe on me, Breath of God. And our opening hymn to lead into the reading is Come Down, O Love Divine. Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Now then, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one of them heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. Just a prayer as we start. Holy Spirit, so move our hearts and minds that we may know Jesus more clearly, follow him more nearly and love him more dearly day by day. Amen. Two or three weeks ago, the Lord Chief Justice was giving evidence to a parliamentary committee and they asked him how he saw the future of the court service. And he said he didn't know what the future was going to be. The only thing he was sure about was that we couldn't go back to where, where it was in February of this year. We have experienced and learned far too much in the meantime to do that. As I thought on that, it seemed to me that was exactly the position the disciples must have been in on the night before Pentecost. They knew that God was going to work, but they had no idea in practice what it was going to involve. The only thing they did know for certain was that they couldn't go back to life as it was three months or so before. And actually, we're in exactly the same position. Uh, this virus will have changed things, uh, we, but we have no idea how. Will we have as much trouble reopening churches as we've had reopening schools? Uh, what will worship be like? What will be the impact of weeks or even months of people being denied Holy Communion? I don't know. And because we haven't confronted these problems for the last 800 years, I don't believe anybody knows. But of one thing we can be sure, that we can't go back to the way things were before. Too much has happened, too much has been learnt, and we're going to have to look ahead. Does that feel rather scary? Well, I think in a way it does. But we have to remember that the spirit who enthused and filled those disciples at Pentecost is exactly the same spirit who longs to enthuse and inspire his disciples today. Of course, we are in different times. His methods will be different. We're different people. We live in a different culture. Things will be different. But his purposes are always the same. And two of them emerge fairly clearly from uh, this chapter two of the book of Acts. The first is that we're told that people heard the good news about Jesus in a way that they could understand. All of them, wherever they'd come from, looked at astonishment in each other and said, everybody hears this message in their own language. And it seems to me one of the things the Spirit is going to be doing is enabling people to hear the gospel in a way that they can understand. Wherever we live, wherever we work, whoever we're with, it is by our lives how we live, what we do, what we say, that people have a chance of hearing and understanding the gospel in a way that they understand. And they understand because we understand them. So that people will hear the gospel. And that's, uh, as it were, a, a crucial part of what the Spirit's work will be and always has been. 
And the second thing that the Spirit will be doing that he did at Pentecost is showing Christians about how to live together as the people of God. A little further on in Acts chapter 2, uh, we read that the Christians uh, were all gathered together day by day as they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. The way in which Christians live together can be a powerful witness for, just as it can be, sadly, a powerful disincentive to people believing in the message of Jesus. So those uh, things that the Spirit was anxious to do on that very first Pentecost is something that the Spirit is anxious to do now and to do with us as we go into these new tables times. Is that scary or is it encouraging? My guess is it's a bit of both. And I want to finish, if I may, with some words that Jeremiah wrote to the um, people of God in exile in Babylon. Words that a member of our congregation drew Erica and my attention to uh, on an occasion when we were finding life particularly difficult. And it comes from Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 it says this, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. Amen. Your church was born in wind and fire and words of power. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord, when we forget the power that lies within and trust instead upon our human strength. Remind us of that glorious day when your spirit transformed the lives of those who hid in fear into people of power. Renew our hearts that we might be the church that you desire. Amen. Gracious and loving God, give wisdom and strength to all those in our community and around the world who are responding to the coronavirus. Health professionals, care providers, food and essential supplies providers, school leaders 
and government officials. May those sick with the virus know your comfort and healing. May those who mourn the loss of loved ones be comforted. May those in our community who are feeling anxious find peace and reassurance. And let us pause to remember those known to us. May our churches be places of compassion, attentive to those who are in need. May we be communities of empathy, love and care, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, let us bring all our prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 